Um, Galatians chapter 3 is where we are at tonight, and we will cover the first nine verses, and I will show you real quickly um, the, the breakdown of the chapter. Two main divisions. Tonight we'll see questions to consider, and then uh, next time we will see Christ over the curse. Um, Galatians, in the event that you are, are visiting or you're new, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Um, during the summer, we'll start having the, the incoming freshmen. We'll start trickling in. And so if that's you tonight, we're glad that you're here. And uh, this is not like high school where if you're the freshman, you know, you get dumped in the trash can and those kinds of things. We don't do that here. We love you. We're glad that you're here. And so uh, we hope that you will keep coming. If you're new, you're not a freshman, but you're new, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Uh, Galatians was written by a man named Paul. He was an apostle. He was sent by God, working for God. And he was writing to the Galatians because the Galatians had previously received Jesus, just like you and I have received Jesus, Christians. And then somewhere along the line, the Galatians started to believe that though they had gotten saved by grace, through faith, okay, in other words, by the grace of God, by placing their faith in God, um, they believed that they then needed to go back to the beginning, kind of start over, and start living their lives according to the law. That, 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 word, that, that phrase, the law, refers to the Old Testament, all the commandments, the laws, the rules that we find there in uh, after the children of Israel came out of uh, Egypt in, in um, Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And um, this may seem somewhat archaic for a lot of us. Well, you know, I, I don't do that. You know, I'm not going back and reliving the law and trying to live my life according to the law. Basically what was happening is the Galatians were trying to please God by following the rules, following the laws. And, uh, you know, make the, the sacrifices and all the different things from the Old Testament. And, and, and Paul is writing to the Galatians to tell them, hey, you don't need to do that. You're already saved. And God already loves you. And by doing these, these, uh, these laws, by trying to live your life according to the law, um, it's not pleasing to the Lord because what you're trying to do is you're trying to earn a spot with God. And you know what? We cannot earn a spot with God. The good news is, here's the good news, this is not even good news, it's great news. The great news is that we cannot earn a spot with God. God will just give you a good spot with Him. How does He do that? He does that when we place our faith in Him. When we place our faith in the finished work of Jesus. Then we just get that good standing. We just get that good spot. Doesn't sound fair, does it? I know, doesn't sound fair. But that's what God does for us. But the Galatians were thinking, hey, we got to go back. we got to start fulfilling all the laws so that way God will like us more and we'll be more, you know, we'll be holier. Now, why were they, I mean, what was it? What was causing them to all of a sudden think that, okay, this is what we got to do? What was happening was there were teachers, Bible teachers that were coming into the Galatian church and they were telling them these things. And the, these teachers that were coming in and telling these guys these things, the, telling the Galatians this, these were Jews. And they knew about the law. They knew about the Ten Commandments and all of the rules and all of the law and the you know you got to sacrifice and you got to uh, do these things on this day and you know you better make sure you're in church on this specific day. These were Jews, and so they came in and began to lead the Galatians astray to make the Galatians think that all of a sudden, hey, I know you got saved by grace through faith. It was by the grace of God when you placed your faith. That's good. That's a good start. But now you need to finish it or make it better by following all of the laws. And so Paul is writing to the Galatians to say, no, 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 that's not the way this works. And what he will do in chapter 3, he actually, you'll see there in verse 1, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, you fools. He tells the Galatians. And, and here's what happens. In verses 1 through 9, he's going to give us questions to consider. And I, uh, those of you that are here all of the time, you know, here's what I normally do. You got, you got your main heading there, verses 1 through 9, questions to consider. And then normally I start putting sub points in there. Normally I have, you know, two or three or four. Sometimes I have a little more. 
Well, I started to uh, 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 type in all of my subpoints here in this section, and I realized there's not enough room in here. So here's what I've done. I've left it blank. And what I want you to do, if you're a note taker, follow along. There's so much in these nine verses that I'm looking at the clock and hoping that I can get through all of them. And if I can't, that's all right. We'll just come back to it. Okay? But there's so much in here that Paul is, is sharing uh, um, or, or, or pointing out, I should say, about the Galatians. Now, now, Paul's point in writing this chapter here, or at least these nine verses, is he's asking them questions that are going to jumpstart their faith. He's asking them questions that are going to get them to question their own motives and the things that they're doing. That's a, that's a good way sometimes to, to make your point with someone. You ask them questions. And then they go, hmm, I don't know what the answer is to that. And they start to think about it and consider it and analyze it. And, and then hopefully they come to the right decision or you know they've got the right answer or whatever. But that's, that's, a, that's a good way of, of making your point. And so that's what Paul is doing here. Now, he says, he calls them fools because, again, they're trying to go back to the old ways of doing things. And so he starts out in verse 1 by saying, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Now, again, I said I'm leaving this spot blank because you're going to see here, I'll start pointing it out, there are things that Paul, there, there, there are several statements that Paul makes about the Galatians. Some are good, some are bad. He starts out with the bad ones. And here's a question that he asks. This is the first question. He says, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? So the first question is, who has bewitched you? Now that word bewitched is not just an old TV show about a witch married to a salesman, but that word bewitched means who has cast a spell on you. Now, I do not think, I do not believe that Paul is, is talking about an actual spell. I, I don't think that Paul uh, believed that, that the Galatians actually had a some kind of, you know, a uh, 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 brewy wooey spell put over them and that they had no choice. They were now zombies without, you know, any kind of will of their own. He's, he's saying, listen, who is it? He's asking them a question. Who is it? Which teacher was it that came into your church and cast a spell on you? In other words, they're, they're drawing you away. Now, I started to say a moment ago that some of us may see this as just, oh, this is archaic. You know, nobody, in other words, old. You know, this is old stuff. Nobody, you know, nobody's, nobody's doing that today. That's, this is from a long time ago. No, but, but, but this still these things still happen today. It is, it is not uncommon. It's very common, even for Christians and the church, uh, to be drawn away by someone. Uh, there are churches that are filled, maxed out, thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are there, not necessarily to meet with God, but to watch a speaker. Uh, because some speakers are flashy, and uh, they've got the right they got the right words and they've got the right fit and everything about them is, you know, they, they're the whole package. And so, and so what happens is oftentimes people will show up to church to see the person rather than to meet with God or to hear God's word. It's very common. It's not hard to jump on YouTube or whatever and, you know, pull up some, some Bible teacher and uh, who's flashy and they're a great speaker and they're um, captivating and, you know, they're good looking and, you know, all they just got, they got the whole thing. But what happens is, 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 is as you begin to listen, what you start to do is you start to analyze because you guys are Bible students. You start to analyze and you go, wait a minute. They're, they're a really great speaker, and they're exciting, and they tell a bunch of really cool stories. But what what are they teaching? And I've done that very thing. I was like, I'm listening. Oh, man, this is, this is great. This, this guy's a, man, he's a great speaker. Or maybe new, maybe it's it's even a lady. And, and man, she's a great speaker. And I'm listening, listening, listening. And then after a while, I'm just like, 
what are they talking about? Because they, they just finished telling their fourth story, and I'm not sure what, what, what passage of Scripture are they teaching. It's very easy to be mesmerized or captivated by a speaker. How did a nation, an entire nation, and I realize it wasn't every single citizen. In fact, there were many that were against him. But how did a nation, how did a nation get carried away by a small man with a funny mustache who was, who was preaching preaching in fact he was preaching wasn't preaching the bible but he was he was preaching you know nazi germany and the and the glory of germany how did an entire nation you ever, you ever stop to think about that like like why did so many people listen to to, to to hitler and it wasn't even just the germans there were others other countries that went along with it how did that happen it started with a captivating message from a strange little man but it was so powerful that people were carried away with it. He was so passionate about it that people believed whatever it was that he was saying. And that's, you know, we, we, we might think, well, that's hard to do. Who would do that? There's no way I would listen to Hitler. You know, that guy's crazy, you know. But, but watching his speeches, if you've ever done that, I've not done a lot of it, and I don't understand German, so, you know, but, but watching him, the guy is so passionate, and he's, whatever, whatever it is he's saying, I don't know, he could have been talking about hot dogs, but it's like, it's like, oh my goodness, like, you know, whatever he's saying, he really believes it, and, and it drew people in, and there was a message that went along with the man and all of that, but even today, it's very easy to be captivated, to be mesmerized, by, to be carried away by someone. And so Paul asking the Galatians, hey, who cast a spell on you? Who bewitched you? That's not something foreign or something that we do not understand. No, it's, in fact, it's very common today. But Paul begins by saying about the, the Galatians that they had been bewitched. Here's another thing that he says about them, if you're a note taker. He says that they were not obeying the truth. They were disobedient to the truth. It says it there in verse 1. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Whoever this captivating speaker was, he had led the Galatians away from the truth, the simple truth that you've been saved by the grace of God through faith, and you had turned away from that, and you were now disobedient to the truth. Now, again, there's just not enough time in the day, but I need to make sure that I explain these things to you. And so for some of you, if I'm going a little too slow, please forgive me. But I think that this is, this is, I think that this is really um, extremely important. I would, I would use the phrase, it's, it's, um, uh, this is life and death stuff. And here's why. Because there are still people today who, when they find out that you are a Christian, are going to, to to try to put you in some kind of a some kind of a box, some kind of a trap. Here's what I mean. I've seen it. Here's what I mean is they're going to ask you, oh, so you're a Christian, and they're going to want to impose some kind of rules on you and say, well, you know, do you do you go to church on this day? You know, do you go to church on do you celebrate the Sabbath? Do you go to church on Saturday? Because that's you know you, that's what the Bible says. I've heard it. Or they're going to try and say, well, listen, um, you know, do you, you celebrate Christmas? Yeah. With a Christmas tree? Yeah. Why? Oh, you do, huh? Mm. Oh. But don't you know that, you know, Christmas trees aren't in the Bible? Or, or they'll go to some obscure passage, you know, in the book of Isaiah, and it's like, look what it says about trees right here, you know? And they will try to put a trip on you. Now, you know. Celebrate with a tree or don't celebrate with a tree. What does it matter? Neither one is going to get you any closer or any further from God. But but what will happen is, 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 is people will try to, to, to lock you down with certain rules or, or regulations to try to tell you, well, if you're a Christian, you have to do these things. The question that I always want to ask, maybe you're not sure. You go, well, I don't, I don't know. Am I supposed to be doing that? The question you always want to ask is, well, where's that at in the Bible? Can you show that to me? And then, and then look at the passage and analyze and go, right, you know, maybe I am supposed to, maybe I'm not supposed to. But there are still individuals that are like that, who will try to, to trap you and take you away from the simplicity of believing in Jesus and lock you up with some rules. 
and uh, it's still it's still going on. And so he says, listen, he, he describes it this way. You've been bewitched, and you've, you're not obeying the truth. You're not obeying just the simple truth of Jesus and being saved by the grace of God through faith. He's going to go on to expound upon this. And what he says in, in verse 1, as we finish verse 1, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed or postered. He says, basically he's saying, listen, you clearly saw Jesus. Jesus was preached to you. You clearly saw Jesus. But why are you turning away from that simplicity? And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why people turn away from that simplicity. Because it's simple. That's why. Because it's simple. And, and what will happen is, and I, I, I do not know why. Maybe I do know why. I have come across, it, it, it seems to always be young men. And generally speaking, it's uh, college-aged young men who um, oftentimes will get on this trip of uh, they, they, they've gone deeper than you. They, they know God better than you. They've, they've figured out all that there is to know about God. And they will normally try to come and convince you and say, well, you know, you know, you, 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 you're, you know you're, you're living by this or that or whatever. And, and maybe it's because young college-age men, um, maybe it's because they're prideful. That's what it always seems like to me. And, and it always seems like they, they want to have more knowledge than you. They want to have some secret knowledge. And, and so they're going to they're gonna lay some stuff on you and you know, try to get you all locked up. And, and, and listen, you've seen Jesus plainly, all of you. All of you, you, you come in here on Wednesdays and Sundays. Listen, all I'm doing is opening the Bible. That's all I'm doing. And sometimes people will go, oh, uh, do you, hey, well, can I see your notes on that passage? It's like, I, I, I guess, but I really don't have any notes. Whatever you see up there, those are the notes. Like, I'm, this is just, you know, all I'm doing is I'm opening the Bible and, and, and doing my best to ex help you understand it and explain it to you. That's all I'm doing. Um, if I go like this, hey, uh, listen, we're going to have a Bible study now. We don't need this thing. Let me just talk to you. And, and you know, I start to go, you know, into all kinds of stuff. Oh, what have I done? All of a sudden, I have, I've cut off the authority. And listen, if I don't have a Bible to teach, I have no business being here. I don't know, I don't know anything else other than this. There's not much else I can do. I'm pretty good at fixing bicycles. I don't do very well laying flooring. I, I, landscaping, I like. I'm, I'm, I'm okay at that. But other than that, I really don't have anything else going for me. That's pretty much it. I, I'm not really an athlete. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't really have anything. This, this is all I got. And so when you come, that's all I'm going to get. That's all I've got. That's all I can give you. But you follow along with me. You're reading with me. And you're going, yeah, okay, I see what he's saying. Yeah, there it is. Makes sense. Okay, yep. But when somebody starts to, well, you know, let's, okay, let's just let's just read through verse 2. And then, okay, let me go on. Let me tell you some stories. And, you know, you got to be careful. Because it, it can be so easy for them to begin to lead you astray. And you're thinking, well, they read verse 2. And now here they are talking and going on. And, I, you know, I guess, I mean, I guess it's a Bible study. You've got to be careful. You've got to question everything. He goes on in verse 2 to say this. This only I want to learn from you. Here's another question. Did you receive the Spirit? Stop for just a moment. Here's another thing that he says about the Galatians. You, at this point, you might be thinking, man, he's questioning the Galatians. Maybe they're not even saved. No, they're saved. Because he just said that in verse 2. Look what he said in verse 2. The, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by, and he's going to go on and say by the works of the law. But here's the point that I want to make before we move on. They had received the Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit. Paul just said that. They've got the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, what he's asking them is, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? But the fact is that they have the Holy Spirit. So if you're a note taker, you might say the Galatians were bewitched and they were disobedient to the truth. But they did have the Spirit. Now, just a quick little thing. Every Christian Every Christian, that every every person, not just in name only, okay? I'm not just saying, you know, just because you're 
you consider your, you know, my grandpappy was Protestant, and I, you know, my dad was Protestant, and I'm going to be a Protestant, my son's going to be a Protestant, and we're just always going to be Protestant. I'm not talking about just a name or just a title. If you, family, have surrendered your heart to Jesus, you personally, if you've surrendered your heart to Jesus, the Bible teaches that you have the Holy Spirit. And it actually teaches that you've got all of the Holy Spirit. There isn't, like, you know, you, you get saved and you get a little piece of the Holy Spirit. And then if you're really good after a few years, really good Christian, then you'll get the rest of the Spirit. Some people will actually teach that. That, okay, you've got the Holy Spirit, uh, but if you really want all of the Holy Spirit, then you need to come up front. And we need to pray for you to be baptized in the Spirit. And then you'll then, then that means you've got the rest of the Spirit. So as long as you are, you know, you're good or you really, really want it, then, then come on and, and then you can get the rest of the Spirit. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when we get saved, that we get the Holy Spirit. That it's given to us. We don't have to work or follow the rules to try and get more of the Spirit. Now, it is possible that I need the Spirit to have more of me. Maybe I'm withholding myself, you know, trying to, you know, fight the Holy Spirit. But I've got all of the Holy Spirit. That, that's what the Bible teaches, that all of us as Christians, we've got the Spirit. So these people were saved, Paul is pointing out. They've got the Spirit. They received the Spirit. They're saved. But here's the question that he asked him. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit? They did. But did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith now these are this is rhetoric or rhetorical questions he's asking them obvious questions with obvious answers here's the obvious answer to that one in verse two the obvious answer is they received the spirit or they 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 got saved by the hearing of faith in other words by faith so they got saved by faith they received the spirit by faith it wasn't by working and doing things and following the rules and following the law and sacrificing this animal on this day for this specific thing. It wasn't, uh, you know, by having some secret knowledge. No, they got saved and God gave them the Holy Spirit. And that all happened by faith. They placed their faith in God. They placed their faith in Jesus, the Son of God, God in flesh. That's it. And he's asking him there, did you, re you receive the Spirit? Did you do that by the works of the law? Did you do that by following the law? Or was it by faith? The obvious answer is, well, it was, it was by faith. Now, he'll go on to develop this, okay? But I want you to understand this also about the Galatians. They were bewitched, and they were disobedient to the truth. But they had received the Spirit, which indicates to us that they, they were, in fact, saved. But they were trying now to live their lives according to the law. That's what he's pointing out. Are you, why, are you, why are you now doing the works of the law? What, is, what, what are you doing? You started out in faith, continue in faith, finish in faith. That's how this thing works, family. That's how it works. So we understand. They were bewitched. They did not. They were disobedient to the truth. They were trying to work the law to, to be better, to be godlier. They had received the Spirit. They had received the Spirit by faith. He goes on in verse 3 to ask them another question. Here's the next, next question. Are you really this foolish? Are you so foolish, he said. Are you really that foolish? He asked them. It's the second time that he's called them fools. Are you so foolish? And then he goes on with this question in verse 3. Having begun in the Spirit. Stop there for just a moment. What do we learn about the Galatians here? Well, they began in the Spirit. It was a spiritual work that they started. You know, they, they, or, or that, that they allowed God to start in them. They, it was a spiritual work. They didn't get saved or get the Holy Spirit by going back to Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy or, and going, Oh, look what it says. We better sacrifice an animal so that God will give us a spirit. That's not how that worked. They got it by faith. They got it by faith. And so he's asking him here in verse 3, 
You began in the Spirit. He did. He began in the Spirit. Are you now being made perfect by the flesh or following the laws, what he's saying? Now, there's a lot here to unpack. Verse 3 indicates to us that they were acting like fools. Acting like they had gotten saved by following the law. But that's not even, that's not even possible. And, and, and Paul's going to go on to develop all of that. But, but he says... Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect? Now, this indicates to us, here, here's, here's what's going on. There's something in the Bible called sanctification. Sanctification, okay? Sanctification is the name or the word. Here's what it means, or here's what it describes. It's the word that's given to the process, okay? The process of God making us righteous. Now, I'm going to try not to lose you here. I really, really, really want you to understand these things. When you and I get saved, okay, when Easy got saved, the day that he got saved, the moment he got saved, the Bible teaches that he got the Holy Spirit. The Bible also teaches that along with being saved, along with getting the Holy Spirit, that he got this um, this new uh, uh, this new position, and the position was righteous. Okay, now you look at Easy and you go, oh, he's he's a, he's a great guy. Is he righteous? Well, I don't know. Well, he is because the Bible teaches that that he then picture him having like a bank account, Jesus got his righteousness and put it in Easy's bank account. And so he, he declared him righteous. Okay? So all of us as Christians, the Bible teaches that we, doesn't matter how long you be, you can be saved for five minutes or five decades. Okay? Doesn't matter. Once you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit, you also get this position. Positionally, you and I are righteous. That means when God looks at us, he goes, oh, they have the righteousness of Jesus in their account. I see that. Okay? However, however, I think that you all, myself, think I can look at my life and go, uh, God, I understand that your Bible says I'm righteous. However, I don't really always act righteous or righteously. I might be self-righteous, but I'm, I'm, not really, I'm not really living a righteous life. Well, here's where sanctification comes in. Okay? So positionally, we're declared righteous. Then what happens is the sanctification process begins. So we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit, we get the righteousness of Jesus put in our account, Boom, good to go. But then we've got this positional, positionally we are righteous. But then what happens is God begins to practically make us righteous. He begins working in us and changing us. I have got saved when I was 20. When I was 20, I had a filthy mouth, language like a drunken sailor. And a short time after being saved, all of a sudden it dawned on me one day. I started, I went like this. I was like, I don't cuss anymore. And I started thinking like, when was the last time I cussed? And I could not remember. That was God practically sanctifying or practically making me holy or practically making me righteous. That was one of the things that he took away from me as part of that process. Okay? And it's a process. Sanctification is a process. Now, I hope that I haven't lost you. Here's, let's take this back to Galatians. 
chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, you started in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect? That phrase means, are you now being sanctified? That sanctification process. Are you now being sanctified by the flesh? In other words, if the Holy Spirit was the one that first started working in you and started the process of sanctifying you, making you holy, you've got the, 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 the title of righteous, but now God's actually making you righteous. He said, you started that process in the Spirit, as you surrendered yourself to the Holy Spirit, you allowed the Holy Spirit to, to, you know, change you. But somewhere in there you decided, oh, I don't need the Spirit anymore. I'm going to do this myself by following the Old Testament law. So, Holy Spirit, thanks, but that's okay. I got this. And then you started to try to do the process on your own. That's what he's telling the Galatians. And he's saying, this, why would you do that? That's foolish. It's not even possible. We can't sanctify ourselves. We can't make ourselves righteous. We can't, we, we can't start the process with the Spirit and then go, you know what, Spirit? Uh, you're doing a pretty good job, but I think I can do a better job. But a lot of people try to do that. They, a lot of Christians try to do that. They started in the Spirit, but then they get on this trip where, um, you know, all of a sudden they want to, you know, start following all of the Old Testament Jewish laws, thinking that that's going to make them holier or more righteous, or make them righteous, you know, they're going to speed up the sanctification process, and, you know, they're, they're going to make it happen. And so it happens. It happens. And Christians get caught up in sacrificing animals on certain days, and celebrating certain holidays on certain days, certain times of the year. Going to church on Saturdays, the Sabbath. Can't go on Sunday because Sunday, that's the sun god, and you can't do that. And and they will tell you you can't really be a Christian unless you do this thing, and that thing, and this thing, and that thing. And that's fine, okay. I, I can't be a, okay. Show me that in the Bible. Where is it? Where's that in the Bible? That's that's what you and I always want to do. We always want to go back and say, but where's that in the Bible? We always want to go back to the Word. So I'm always taking you back to the Bible. I tell the leaders, when they're talking with you, small groups or giving you some counsel, take them back to the Word. Take them back to the Word. That's that's the authority. That's what we got. If we just chuck this out, say, oh, we don't need that. Then I can start making up my own stuff. Then I can start doing my own thing. Then I can, then I can lay a trip on you and say, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, but you wear that shirt, huh? Mm. Oh, you're a Christian, but oh, you listen to that band, huh? Mm. I don't think you're really a Christian. Oh, 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 you're a Christian, but you watch that show. Mm. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think you're really, I don't think you're really godly. And and now, now there may be some of those areas where, yeah, you know what? I need to correct. I need to, I need to stop doing this or stop watching that or stop listening to this. Sure, okay. But that doesn't make me more saved. Does it make me any less saved? It's the same. I'm still in right standing with God because of Jesus, because of the finished work of Jesus. And you and I need to remember that and rest in that and say, hey, I got Jesus. Jesus is enough. There is no way we're going to be able to go on. I'm stopping in three verses. Man, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight.